Imagine living at odds with the world around you, a life of obstacles at every turn, abandoned by family, denied an education, slighted by society. This scratches the surface of hardships faced by our first hero, the struggles and achievements of Deborah Sampson Gannett are distinctly unique. As the first woman to enlist, to fight in, and to be honorably discharged from the American military, Mrs. Sampson disguised herself in men's attire and used an alias to enlist. She fought bravely in a revolutionary war which would change the balance of global power. Mrs. Deborah Sampson Gannett had no choice but to grow up quickly in the Mass Bay Colony, making crucial life decisions which put her name, her reputation, and her life at risk. She earned the title, the American Heroine and was honored as the official heroine of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1983. Portraying Mrs. Deborah, Gan Deborah Sampson Gannett is Mrs. Judith Kalaora, a local actress and historical interpreter. Judith has focused her energies on historical education for nearly a decade and is honored to bring this revolutionary American to life. And now, Mrs. Deborah Sampson Gannett. How can I be denied an education when my marksman skills were the best of those around me? How can I live the life of a second-class citizen just because I wear this mob cap and these petticoats. Why can I not hold a job or own property? I dare, I dare to break free of these shackles and these chains without this mob cap. Do I see more deserving to you? When I wear a soldier's canteen and a possible's bag, do I now seem more a man to you? How about when I drape my continental jacket over my shoulder, like so. Am I more deserving now? How do these garments entitle me the right to vote when my sisters are denied these rights and freedoms? These are questions I pose to you. Are my accomplishments so great for a woman? Are they so outlandish? When we meet again, we will discuss the colonial society in which I grew up. We will discuss how they rationalized this gender caste system, which I risked my life to defy. I am Deborah Sampson Gannett. I am your daughter of liberty and I am your son of liberty. I am your American heroine. An unknown frontier lawyer, when he threw his hat into the presidential ring in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was considered by many a country bumpkin given to storytelling. But his stories went beyond humor, relieving stress, and carried his philosophy and his beliefs. A whimsical and devoted family man, a shrewd and determined politician, a private and troubled individual burdened by personal loss and national tragedy. Lincoln's life experience honed him into the able and innovative commander-in-chief who guided us through the ultimate national crisis, the American Civil War. Lincoln expressed difficult concepts in simple yet profound language, reaching the common man. His intellect coupled with his deep humanity, made him the definitive leader of our nation. He preserved the Union. Even the defeated Southerners felt his influence, 
many of whom soon realized at his untimely death that they had lost perhaps their best friend. Presenting Lincoln here is Philip Chetwind, who began portraying Lincoln in 1987 in performances from Virginia to Maine, from the Cub Scouts to the White House, under the name Lincoln for the Ages. When I ran against my old friend Steve Douglas for his Senate seat in 58, now, we had a series of debates, seven in all, in which the main difference between us was that he believed any new territory applying for statehood should be allowed to choose for themselves whether they're slave or, or free. And I felt any new territory applying for statehood should come in as a free state, stop the extension of slavery, but not interfere with it where it already existed. Now. I lost that election, but because all the newspapers came from all over the country and covered our debates, more people across the country were reading about where I stood on the issues. So, as a result, two years later, when the new Republican Party offered me their platform to run for president, I was able to gain the presidency. Now, I think that's a fair exchange. Mr. Douglas got to keep his Senate seat, but I got the presidency. Mr. Douglas and I always seemed to be on opposing sides, whether it was in the courtroom or politically. Why, he was even courting Miss Todd at the same time I was. And uh, I met Miss Todd at a social that was being held by her brother-in-law, Ninian Edwards. And I remember when I was introduced to her, I was quite taken. I told Miss Todd I would like to dance with her in the worst way. Well, she told her friends later that I truly did dance with her in the worst way. Apparently, I stepped on her toes a couple of times. Most books about the American Civil War feature endless battle statistics and highlight famous generals and armies. Rarely do they mention, however, how the work of engineers contributed to the success of those generals and armies. Of over 3,500 regiments, battalions, and companies in the United States military service, only 6% were engineer units. Civil War engineers designed and erected fortifications, surveyed, prepared maps, and built bridges and roads. Private Sam of the 15th New York Engineers now addresses a squadron of fresh recruits, introducing them to tasks and skills in which they will soon become well-versed. Living historian Sally Chetwind began reenacting in 1975. She developed this engineering role from her work in today's civil engineering profession. Under the name Brass Castle Arts, she also offers computer drafting, historical music, writing and editing, and graphic arts, besides hands-on living history programs. Now this book here, this is Duane's Manual. Captain Duane of the Engineer Corps produced it in 1862, so it's a pretty new book. This will tell you everything you need to know. Now you'll notice I'm merely a private, but you recruits, you're the same rank as I am. But because I have experience, because of this book and the training that it has given me, I have the ability and the authority and the experience to train you folks on how to become engineers. So one of the things that we need to know how to do is uh, when the army is on the move, we need to be able to cross streams. One of the means by which we do that is through the use of pontoon bridges. And uh, we have whole wagons full of materials by which we can haul bridges with us and put them together. A pontoon is really nothing more than a canvas tent upside down in the water. The canvas is oiled, it has a wooden frame. The canvas is tied to the frame so that it stays together. The whole thing is mortise and tenon construction. You've got the peg in the hole. The pressure of the water helps keep all of that pulled together so it's not gonna fall apart on us. We're gonna go across the stream perpendicular to the flow. We start out with something called balk. These are very heavy beams. You see some of those up here on the shore. We dig one in as an abutment, 
fix it with a couple of pins, and then we start putting these boats in the water, one right next to the other. They are facing up and down stream. They're side by side, they go across the stream. Once you've got th two or three or four of them there, then you can start putting some more balk across the tops of them on the gunnels. And with ropes, we lash the box to two of the pontoons. Then when we've got a few of them out there, we start putting planking down. The planking is called chess. And they're notched so that we can use more rope to uh, lash to the balk. So the chests are lashed to the balk, the balk are lashed to the pontoons. The pontoons are anchored to the stream, to the shore, and eventually you get across to the other side and you've got a pretty good bridge. This bridge is stable enough to take artillery, to take uh, infantry, to take cavalry. They can be made double wide. If it's going to be down for any length of time, we put earth on it. It helps protect the wood from wearing out. The army, their job is to destroy things. They destroy towns, they destroy enemy troops, they destroy bridges, they, uh, they destroy supply depots. The engineers' work enables the army to do its job, but by doing so, we build things. Dismissed. Ulysses S. Grant was a family man, a dedicated citizen, a military and presidential hero. He loved horses and smoked cigars, but most importantly, he was, from the very beginning, a common man, an essential American. His story of adversity and success remains one of the most inspirational biographies our nation's history has to offer and deserves to be told with the passion and authentic demeanor of Sam Grant as General Ulysses S. Grant. A highly acclaimed academic and motivational speaker, film producer, and United States Navy veteran, Sam has dedicated the last 20 years of his life to understanding, portraying, and honoring Ulysses S. Grant. His inspiring and informative visits are entirely first person, and all audiences that have engaged him in the past have left with the overwhelming feeling that they have experienced the true General Grant up close and personal, as history should be. General Grant will be introduced by his loving and devoted wife, Mrs. Ulysses S. Grant. In the words of our contemporaries, and I shall quote from them this evening, the general was once described as, and I quote, brave as any man should be. He is not a brilliant man, but he is a good and brave soldier, sober, tried for years, industrious, and as kind as a child which is another reason why it deeply concerns me that anyone would remember General Grant as a drunk with a penchant for whiskey. Historical evidence will show that rumors of my husband's alcoholism were simply cooked up by his political enemies at the time. How could someone succeed in so many battles and have that kind of a problem? And in a most endearing manner, I do digress, another newspaper described him as an ordinary, scrubby-looking man with no gait, no station, and no flashy manner. In fact, once a British correspondent once said of Ulysses, and I quote, I never met a man with so much simplicity, shyness, and decision. He is a soldier to the core, a genuine commoner. A commander of a democratic army of a democratic people. No more afraid to command a million men than a small company. I have been asked on a number of occasions why the war lasted so long, was so hard and so bloody. For myself, I believe it is simply that this war was fought here in America. Americans against Americans. And Americans do not back down from a fight. In this war, the soldiers and sailors who fought it were fighting for the same ideas, the same causes for which their fathers and grandfathers before them had fought. 